a sister-in-law that just sent me a photo during a sunset in Houston. And she's like, oh, look at these beautiful colors. I should just text her back and say, that's actually disgusting. <laughs> Your air quality is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Fifth Wall Climate Tech Vodcast. We're excited to, to be here with you today. My name's Christian Thatcher and I'm with... Hey guys, I'm Cedric Char. I'm also uh, an investor on, on Fifth Wall's Climate Tech team. Super excited to uh, be logging in here this week. I think this week we're going to be talking about Tesla's uh, chargers, democratizing their the access to everyone else. And then I think we're also going to be touching on how renewables are also just healthier for everyone. We could also talk about uh, your carbon impact versus my carbon impact too, Cedric. <laughs> hey, shorter people <laughs> use less carbon and less resources. <laughs> Hey, that's that's science. Op ed. All right. So big news this week in that Tesla is going to be opening up some of their chargers to other EVs. Traditionally, these have been strictly exclusive to Tesla vehicles. As you could think, if you were going to buy an electric car, obviously a charging network is a huge differentiator. Um, so this was one of the biggest selling points for maybe a lot of potential EV buyers. Um, now they're going to open that to the to all other car brands. So Cedric, what, what are some of the implications around this or why is this a big deal? Having their captive charging network it was a huge competitive advantage, right? Like my friends, when I was contemplating buying an EV, was they were their hardcore, you know, Tesla Tesla diehards. They were pushing Tesla even just beyond the car itself and the merits of, of the car. Just looking at the EV charging network, you know, I think a lot of uh, anxiety about switching to electric vehicles is just the the range anxiety right like how many times how, how far can you get on a single charge and how many times will you have to charge it you know in a single day um and so just by having the the biggest network out there that's you know a huge uh huge business moat for tesla and so it is a pretty big deal that they are you know democratizing access to their chargers um, and opening it up for for everyone and and other evs to to uh, plug into yeah, I believe I believe the correct term on top of range anxiety is actually called premature electrification. <laughs> is that an actual thing? Yeah, if you it. saw if you saw that it's like it was probably one of my favorite Super Bowl commercials um, by GM when they announced or not GM but uh, Ram specifically Ram Trucks um, announced their new EV truck that they're releasing and they did a full commercial about premature electrification because. That's probably the number one thing is re range anxiety and running out of range. And I, as someone who drives an electric vehicle myself, um, it, the, the range is a little bit shorter. It works for most of what I'm trying to do, but having access to chargers and, and charger networks traditionally have a ton of issues like connectivity um, or they're broken and they're not well maintained. So having a really clean, sleek Tesla charging, um, exclusive charging network is, is great. But what I, what I hear is that, you know, Tesla, who's actually been left off on and kind of picked on a little bit, maybe in, in the green climate companies lists of past, um, was actually excluded from some government funding actually because, or they didn't qualify for some government funding because their networks of chargers were exclusive. So this may, you know, where it seems like a, a questionable business type um, move because now that exclusivity for Tesla owners is lost and maybe it becomes less attractive for Tesla owners because now you're gonna have to wait in a line for chargers because, you know, someone's Hummer is gonna be parked there for, mm -hmm. for a long period of time, Hummer EV, right? But they're actually are potentially opening up a ton of government funding. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, I might have uh, missed that commercial during the Super Bowl because ironically, I was driving back to Tahoe in my gas guzzling Jeep Grand Cherokee. <laughs> so that's that's awkward. Um, but back to your point on, on government funding, I guess I know this this announcement from, from uh, about Tesla was actually in conjunction with the Biden administration. Do you think there is, you know, any political uh, puppeteering that's that's happening behind the scenes or or do you think tesla's doing this on on the merits of a of an actual business case because you can also make the the argument i think um that you know evs are starting to uh it's 
becoming a race to the bottom. You know, we've seen Tesla drop their prices already. We've seen other EV manufacturers drop their prices. Um, and so do you think this is a strategic business move by Tesla or do you think Elon Musk is still just distracted with uh, Twitter? I, I think 100% it's a strategic move. Undoubtedly, Elon Musk is a little distracted by Twitter. I mean, he's come out and he's said, I mean, you know, he's distracted by Twitter when you know, when you see your entire Twitter feed is Elon Musk likes and <laughs> <laughs> tweets, right? I don't know what's happening there. So I'm sure we'll get more stories on that end. But I also do believe he's got some really smart people around the table at Tesla that are helping run things day to day. Um, that's not you know, just a bunch of slouches over there by any means. I'm sure that there's some back channeling and um, some pushing from from the government because, I mean, how are they going to hit the network? I think, you know, hit the network goals that they want with just building, you know, de novo or from scratch. I think there there will be a ton of build out that we see. I think we're, we're bullish on that space as well. But you could immediately add, you know, potentially, I think it's over 2,500 chargers across the U.S. or globally that Tesla has. And so immediately giving access to those would uh, like really help in terms of those goals. And there's also just so much money flying around with the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Like billions and billions of dollars. I just think if you were a business owner and there was, you know, access to billions of dollars, like it'd be very prudent of you to to take those as long as there weren't too many I guess, uh, side rules or whatever written on that. Yeah, true. I guess in, in addition to the, the government funding that it also just expands, you know, Tesla's EV charger TAM, if you will, right? Because now they're just able <laughs> to, uh, to monetize all of the EV drivers and not just, you know, Tesla drivers. So exactly, exactly right. Because on the charging side of the business, you're making money on just like the the output of the chargers, which essentially has to do with the throughput of cars um, that you have on it. Mm -hmm. And so utilization rates are the name of the game with these chargers. And now, you know, maybe I think industry standard utilization rates are kind of in like the sub 10% range, um, right? Like for, I guess, to, to explain that more broadly, right? It's like out of 24 hours of the day, only 2.4 of those hours are actually being used for charging um, is kind of um, what we're saying in terms of utilization rates. But now if you open up to the whole network of EVs and you see the EV adoption curves, maybe there's a big recurring revenue business that um, could also be very strategic for them and getting their chargers up to like, you know, 40% plus utilization rates. How much do you think this kind of accelerates the the broader EV market adoption? I guess, you know, does this bring it forward a, a, a few years, one year, six months? I guess, what what do you think the impact is there? I, don't, I think the impact will actually be negligible. I don't think it's going to be a massive impact in EV adoption. Hot I take. think... I think it's just already, I think EV adoption is just already happening, whether Tesla was going to open up their charging network or not. And I think that there's so many other companies going after this EV charging issue. There's going to be plenty of solutions eventually. It's just going to take a little bit of a build out. There's going to be some, you know, utility and infrastructure hardening that we'll have to do as well. But uh, I think people already get the value out of EVs and then where I think the real unlock for EVs is going to be in the battery ranges themselves. When the EV has a range of like 600 miles or 500 plus miles on a single charge, I think that's where the adoption curve just just skyrockets and just gets super steep, right? Um, I think the charging network, you know, will be influential, but not as influential as the battery side. That's fair. Sounds like a uh, shameless plug to one of our portfolio companies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of shameless plugs. <laughs> You're a walking, talking billboard. We know the size of Tesla's charging networks around the 2,500, 2,600 fast charger range. Is that really going to make a dent in the whole scheme of things? No. Short answer is no. Studies show that by, by 2025, about a fifth of all vehicles will be EVs on the road. And you know by 2030, there's going to be 230 million EVs. So... 25 to 3,500 Tesla chargers is is a lot right now and, and nothing to, you know, scoff at. It's not really a drop in the bucket. We're going to need a lot more 
hardware players, software players, infrastructure investments to actually move the needle for for EV charging. But you know, a lot of the charging is going to happen not in public areas, but at homes, in in single families, in you know, apartment buildings, multi-family structures, and. It's it's going to be all about kind of project deployment and project management to to get uh, these chargers installed as fast and as cheap as possible. So I think there's going to be a lot more uh, a lot more competition in the space, um, and you know, I think it's uh, it is a good thing. Um, we're going to need uh, all the solutions we can get. Yeah, I resonate with that comment because as again as an EV driver myself. Like a majority of the charging I do is at home. It's just, it's kind of hard, even though like stopping at a fast charger is great. Um, it's still kind of, you know, it's disruptive to your trip normally. Like, like I'm not used to penciling in an additional like 20 to 45 minutes to charge my car right when I need to. Um, or when I'm on my way somewhere, like if I'm on my way to work, for instance, in the morning, it's like, oh, shoot, stopping for 30 minutes. Like, how do I like make that super productive? And and so I, I do do most of my charging at home. And I think you hit on another key point here, too, is that there's going to be needs for different types of chargers, right? Like Loop that you brought up, those are level two chargers. I think they do some level three charging, which is the, the fast charger, right? Um Tesla has the fast charger network. You don't always need a fast charger though. And, and a, the span one is a level two, two. Um, so you have level one, two, and three. Um, level two, kind of the sweet spot for home. Um, but some people will just plug in with a level one, um, depending on the capacity size of their battery. But um, but I think that's like another thing we'll see play out in the market too, is like, well, how much infrastructure needs to be built out for a fast charger versus how much infrastructure is needed for a level two charger because the the power needs are just way different um it's way less for level two obviously and so so i think that'll be another interesting dynamic to see how that plays out maybe a speed premium does dominic toretto convert to ev me familia <laughs> me familia es electrica <laughs> i don't have friends I got family. Double clicking on, on kind of the mass mass adoption um, and what it takes, but thinking about you know the the consequences and byproducts of uh, mass electrification. Did you just see you know there was a, a recent study done in, in California that the air quality has gotten noticeably better because of the proliferation of EVs. In a recent California study, they, they found that, you know, with the proliferation of EVs, there has been a noticeable impact on better air quality. They found that, you know, for every increase, uh, every 2% increase uh, of EVs on the road, it drops NOS concentrations by 41 parts per billion, which, again, doesn't seem uh, like much, but for, for air quality standards, it's a, uh, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, I mean, I'm not shocked by, by this at all, but glad the studies are coming out around this um, because we, we do need to take into account these other, I guess, adverse effects of climate change and of fossil fuels, right? Like fossil fuels are not just bad in terms of like, oh, we make, you know, petrochemicals, make plastics and plastics are, you know, all over our oceans, but actually, you know, there's particulate matter that's going into the air that is very deadly for you to breathe. So yeah, hopefully we'll continue to see added health benefits. I, uh, one other thing I'll add to this is I actually took an econ class at, at my university and one of the professors, actually the, the leading authority on all things like air quality and um, air quality and the economic impact of air quality. So I'd be curious. I'll have, maybe I'll have to reach out to him to see what his thoughts were on EVs and air quality because there actually is you know, not only just health benefits, but actually economic impacts that roll out from, from things such as air quality. Oh, for sure. And I I'm, and I'm, I'm, would imagine that it's, uh, it disproportionately affects people you know, across the, uh, the income spectrum from you know, the LMI, LMI communities who are kind of stuck in lens um, without you know, access to the coast and better kind of wind circulation. And so they, they get impacted heavier than uh, the coastal communities. One thing that, that I was uh, thinking about just when, when I was reading that article is uh, it's funny because in, when I was going to school in L.A., 
Um, we would have some of the most beautiful sunsets, just, you know, pastel colors, amazing blues, pink, oranges, purples. Uh, and then I realized that it was all due to, a lot of it was due to uh, the smog and um, pollution from from gas, gas guzzling vehicles. So hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll get uh, more EVs, but still hoping for some amazing sunsets in the future. That's funny. It made me think of a sister-in-law that just sent me a photo that was... Uh right uh, during a sunset in Houston. And she's like, oh, look at these beautiful colors. And I should just text her back and say, that's actually disgusting. (laughs) Your air quality is terrible. (laughs) So uh, that wraps up this week's episode. Thanks for joining us this week. And we will see you next week. If you have any suggestions, feedback, comments. Yeah. And yeah, tell us below in the comments if you're going to be nostalgic for polluted sunsets. Also, throw us a bone, like, subscribe, comment. You know, we you, we are uh, on all social media channels. LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. <laughs>